The title of our message here today is Raising Good Kids in a Crazy World. Isn't this a crazy time to raise kids? It's a scary time to raise kids. And yet in this passage of scripture, we see Jesus as the ultimate model for child development as we see that in Luke 2, 52. And if you have a Bible, you'll be opening up there. But you know the joy of children, just praying for little Sophia and, uh, and mom and dad and just... There's this package, and I don't know about you, but I didn't grow up in the Lord. I didn't grow up with a model of what marriage looked like. I didn't grow up with what a model of raising kids looked like. I was a little vagabond, really, <laughs> and uh, grew up raising myself, by and large, because of the, um, the craziness of my life. And with that, as I grew up, I was the youngest of four, so I really, I mean, just to be honest, I didn't really care about kids. I never babysat kids. I didn't watch kids, and kids were actually kind of annoying to me. You know, when I'm growing up. And even as I got older, I'm like, yeah, there's some kids. They're really loud brats. And, uh, it, and that was just my perspective. And then I got saved. And then I wanted to get married. And I wanted to have kids. And so I knew nothing. I was like this, uh, not a blank slate. I actually come with a lot of garbage. And I was an individual that had to dig into God's word to see how to do marriage. How, how does the Bible tell me to have a marriage? How do you love a wife? And then I had to dig in when we had children to discover what it's like to raise kids. And what the craziest phenomenon is, is that a person that I really, kids weren't on my radar, I didn't really care, but when we were going to have kids, something changed, right? That's what happens. The Greeks have a word for it. They have various words for love, but family love is the Greek word storge. And it's a word that identifies something that it feels almost supernatural, that when you have this child... It's 23 of your chromosomes, it's 23 of your wife's chromosomes, and here you have this child. I didn't know I could feel this way about a human I had never met before. But you take a guy that's kind of a guy's guy, not really into the whole kid thing, and then I have a baby. It was almost like that Lion King sing, like, whoa! Have you ever seen a son? This is the child of the ages, right? And you're showing him off to everybody as if nobody's seen a kid. And especially a newborn. I mean, moms are like, they're beautiful. I mean, they, they look like half-baked from an alien movie. They're not quite done. <laughs> and you have this child, and now you're like, wow. When I, when I got a driver's license, I had to study and take a test. They didn't even make me study and take a test for this kid. And they just let me take it home, an individual. And especially the firstborn. Let me just tell you, if you are a fairly well-adjusted firstborn, it's a miracle because you were the experiment. <laughs> but you know how it goes. The firstborn, the album's filled with like five albums of pictures. And the second one that's about half as much and about the third one, I was the fourth one. Is like, is there any pictures of Rick? Nah, you've seen one, you've seen them all. That's, that's just the way it is. And, and you're trying to figure out this, this thing called family. And God created family, and he knows how to make it work. He's designed it, and if you'll listen to, if you'll look at the owner's manual, <laughs> the owner's manual tells us how to do it. The day my son was born, my wife was recovering, and uh, he was in the, you know, the uh, children's area, and I went to the store, and I bought a football, and I bought a picture Bible the day my son was born. What a waste for about three years, right? Because all they do is eat, sleep, and poop for, you know, the first couple of years. And, but I had this vision of what, man, I was so excited to be a dad, and I, I didn't know what that felt like. Something happened inside of me, and I absolutely fell in love, not only with my wife, but then my, when my son came along, and my daughter. And now I have grandkids, and wow, what a gift. Not only are your children and your grandkids, and my wife and I have enjoyed absolutely every phase of raising kids. It's just been the joy of our hearts. My son is 32. Uh, next, uh, in two months, my daughter turns 30, and we have two grandchildren, and obviously, they're the smartest, most brilliant, beautiful. You know how it goes if you're a grandparent. It's just bias, and you understand that, that it's bias. But if you and I are going to raise kids today, and you might think, man, I'm so bummed I got up here today because I haven't had kids in the house for 30 years. Right? You're going to talk about raising kids? Well, I want you to know something, that in the development of Jesus, because he was the perfect son of God, there's a lot of things that no matter how old we are, we're still learning. We're still growing. We are being changed from glory to glory. There's a lot of stuff I don't have figured out. How about you? 
And I have a lot of growing to do in that process. And so we're going to look at Luke 2, 51 and 2 in our Bible. So let's stand together, read this portion of Scripture, and let the Spirit of the Lord speak to our hearts. It tells us in chapter 2 of the Gospel of Luke, verse 51, Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Heavenly Father, we pray now, we commit this word into our hearts. We pray that your spirit would open our eyes, that we would see wonderful things. We pray that you would strengthen us and our families. Lord, reach our children that are at home, reach our children that are out of the house, reach our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. You promised us, Lord, that you would show mercy to a thousand generations of those who love you. So we stand on that promise that you're going to work in our posterity with our children and our children's children, Lord, by your grace. We pray that you would strengthen our nation. We pray for our president, our vice president, Congress, our governor, and the state legislators. Lord, we pray that your spirit would break into their world, that you would bring salvation to their souls, that they would fall upon their knees and say, Jesus is Lord, that they might lead us in a way that pleases you rather than a way that is destroying our nation. God, help us and help us as your people as we seek to be salt and light in our nation. And we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. 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 You may be seated. Well, as we look at this passage of Scripture about Jesus, it is on the uh, tail end of a story where Jesus is at the age of 12, they go to Passover, and Mary and Joseph, because they would go with a big caravan of people, and then they left with a big caravan of people, uh, coming from Nazareth, which is about 70 miles away, and Jesus just stayed behind. He's 12 years old, and he stays in the house of the Lord. And uh, so Mary and Joseph, they lose the the Son of God, and... uh, They leave him definitely home alone. He's at uh, home, but not alone. And I can relate because, you see, I've been a preacher for 32 years. And there were times I would have Saturday night and three Sunday morning services. My wife would tell me maybe in between the middle service, hey, honey, you remember I had that lunch appointment on Sunday after that service? So you have the kids. So I'd get home exhausted. She's had her appointment. I walk in. She's like, where's the kids? I'm like, oh, they're back at church. So I would go back to church. And I would find them in the back Sunday school rooms. You know, when you're a PK, your preacher's kids, it's your second home. Our kids lived at the church. They felt like it was their second home. I mean, the ushers got after them for eating all the communion snacks. And it's just, you know, they eat the little goldfish. And, and they would give them a hard time. I'm like, hey, they have to spend their life in this place because I live here all the time. And I would go back and get the kids, and I forgot the kids at church actually a couple of times in the time that they were growing up, but they were always safe and sound, playing with their friends in back Sunday school classrooms. And uh, our community, we're out in the country, and it was rural. I mean, it's just a safe place to, to live. Yet, when I think of Jesus now coming on the scene and being the ultimate example for us, we see five dimensions of child development in Jesus' life in these two verses. You may not see it as you first read it, but I want to unpack some things for us here today about raising good kids in a crazy world. We see the five dimensions to child development are uh, relationally, intellectually, physically, spiritually, and socially. These are five dimensions in these two verses as we unpack it. First, we look at relationally in verse 51, and that is cultivating submission to authority. It tells us in verse 51, then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Jesus, the perfect Savior, he told them at the age of 12, his mom and dad, uh, his mom and stepdad, if you will, he said, hey, Uh, didn't you know I must be about my father's business, that I needed to be in my father's house? Now, how would you like the responsibility as an imperfect parent raising the perfect son of God? Talk about intimidation. On top of that, how would you like to be the brother or sister of Jesus and hear your entire life? Why can't you be more like Jesus? It's not an easy story, you guys. It's not an easy story. And so Jesus tells them, but then he went back and Jesus, the perfect savior, son of God, He had to submit. It says he was subject to them. It means he submitted to them to imperfect parents. And the first lesson you learn from child development and even development for us today is you and I have to learn to be submissive to imperfect people, don't we? You have a boss. Are they perfect? No. Do you have to yield to them and do what they ask you to do and do it with a good attitude? Yes, if you want to do well, which can be really challenging, right? 
And parents are not perfect. I told my kids and I comforted myself. I said, hey, you guys, I'm not a perfect parent. I wasn't raised by perfect parents. And my only real encouragement is that one day you'll have kids and you won't be perfect parents too, <laughs> right? But I came from a really broken place in life with multiple marriages, multiple uh, you know, step-siblings and all kinds of things. And when my kids would ask about our family, I would have to like draw a chart like this, these years, this was the marriage and, and then these are the siblings and you know, go through it because my kids, they're like, now, how are they related to you? And I said, well, this is, this is the way it works at Dysfunction Junction. <laughs> so with that, I realized that, you know, my mom and dad are not perfect people. But can I just set you free? If you're an adult and your kid, you're, as a kid, your parents broke your heart, or maybe even today you have an estranged relationship with them, your parents are not perfect. But they did the best they could with what they had. And that phrase is the most freeing thing that I've ever experienced in my life. They did the best they could with what they had. I pretty much raised myself, but you know what? I love my mom, and I honor my mom. I was on the phone last week with my mom. I was on the phone last week with my dad. And they have, they're married to different people now, and, and a lot of waters went under the bridge, and they're not perfect people, but I love my mom and dad. And I love their spouses. And it doesn't mean, and this is the, the, the strange thing that a lot of Christians struggle with, you know what, you can love a perfect God because he's easy to love, but loving people that are less than perfect is a whole different story. People you work with, your neighbors, your parents, whoever it might be. And so Jesus learned relational submission even though he was perfect, but the people that were over him to oversee his life were what? Imperfect. So you have to learn that. If you're going to do well in work, you're going to do well relationally anywhere, you're going to realize you're going to have a boatload of grace for imperfect people that you're ministering with. You're living life. And if you don't, you're going to be a frustrated person because you're constantly putting this high expectation on humans that nobody can meet, and then you're, you're playing the victim like, they're this and they're that. And they're, I mean, you're just going through life miserable, right? And you never just look in the mirror and to see how fall far short you fall in the whole dynamic of life. So the first thing you have to learn if you want to do well in development, I don't care if you're 50 or 5, you have to learn how to navigate this relationally. Now, discovering how to submit to imperfect authority means I, I submit to a point that I'm not going to go to sin, meaning I even submit to the government until it becomes tyrannical and tells us we can't sing right? And we can't meet like we're meeting. Then, okay, now I'm not going to be submissive. So you see the wisdom relationally is discovering when to submit and when it goes too far. I've counseled with women that are, you know, their husbands are domestically abusive. And in me, I'm like, you are not a punching bag. You can get out of this situation. I don't encourage them to run off and divorce. I just encourage them. They need counseling. And if they don't get help, you, you don't have to put up with that because they're to submit as unto the Lord, and there's, a, there's boundaries. So you, you have to become healthy in your mindset of authority and submission, number one. Number two, intellectually, cultivating a love for learning and then application in what you learn. It says in verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom. You see, wisdom is the right application of knowledge. So you gain information. Some people think knowledge and wisdom are the same. They're not the same. Knowledge is the accumulation of information. Wisdom is the application of that. Jesus said it this way. If you hear my words, you have the knowledge of what Jesus said, and you do them, that's wisdom, you'll build a house on the rock. And if you don't do them, then you're foolish. You see, the accumulation of knowledge, Jesus was the ultimate accumulator, if you will, learner, because he was both God in human flesh and human. So, I mean, he's 100% God and he's 100% man. How you can be 200% of anything, I don't know. It's a mystery to me, but that was his journey. And so along the way, he is increasing. What does that mean? He's increasing in wisdom. So he's growing in the process. He came through the journey like we did. So let me just ask you, do you have a love for learning? Are you cultivating that in your kids? You want to learn, but it's not enough to learn information. You need application so it becomes wisdom, right? You can know that the statistics of wearing a seatbelt will save your life in a car wreck. You can have that knowledge, but the wisdom is what? Clicking it. <laughs> it's really simple. You apply the knowledge that you know. Have you ever had a doctor? This is the funniest thing to me. You have a doctor that is sitting there scolding you for your lifestyle, but you look at them and you go, dude, you are not taking care of yourself. 
right? You got a lot of information. You got no wisdom because I think you're like, you got a foot in the grave right now. <laughs> it's just scary, scary stuff. So we want to cultivate relationally, understanding boundaries for submission. We want to cultivate intellectual understanding. Thirdly, we want to grow physically, cultivate an active and healthy lifestyle. It says in verse 52, and stature. So Jesus grew, obviously, from infancy to adulthood. And that's a messy journey, isn't it? How many of you would like to relive junior high all over again? Going through puberty and awkwardness and, I mean, just all the stuff is just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went through an awkward stage between my junior and senior year of high school where, because I was really, I grew really late. I grew three year, uh, inches after I got out of high school. So my senior picture looks like I'm 12 years old. And then I actually became, you know, a man after that. But in between, I had this growing spurt, but only my hands and feet grew. So I looked like this lizard, you know. I, here's this skin and bones and this guy with these hands and the feet. And my friends used to make fun of me. You know, and then they gave me the nickname Bones, which was such a drag. And you go through the journey, but understand this, that all of us, as we're growing, there is just the discovery of learning how to be healthy, how to be active. There's a physical dimension to your life. You see, in all of these things, Jesus fulfilled ultimately what the scriptures tell us. Just one step back intellectually, it says in Luke 2, 10, 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind. You see, if I love God with all my mind, I'm going to have a love for learning. And then in this, physically, in Luke 2, 27, it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your strength. That means you have to have some strength. It means you've got to take care of yourself. Take care of your body. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So in each one of these five dimensions, there's usually a couple of those that we neglect. Some people are great at expanding their intellect, but they're not so good at taking care of themselves physically. Some people are great at taking care of themselves physically, but they're not so great at expanding their intellect. Some people are good at both those things. They take care of themselves physically and intellectually, but they don't know how to get along with other people and submit at work and get a promotion, right? So all of these things, we can be stunted in our growth. Do you realize that? And some of these things are gonna strike a nerve for your own soul because Jesus is the ultimate example for us to come to a place of maturity. In the physical development, it's so important for us to have a good understanding. To, we hear a lot today about a positive body image. Where do you get that from? You see, the greatest revelation you can possibly have is in Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. For you form my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Do you know that I don't care who you are, how tall you are, what color your eyes are, that you are an incredible miracle, and God made you, and God created you. And so where do I get my sense of of worth is that my God loves me, my God created me, my God cares about me. And you may not like this about your body, and maybe it's your nose or your hands or your ear, you know, whatever it is, but you have to develop that perspective about your physical life and come to peace with it, come to grips with it, who you are, and at every stage of life, right? As age starts to come, there's some things that are rather disappointing, aren't there, folks? <laughs> right? Gravity, and I wake up, and I have less collagen, so like if I have wrinkles in the side of my face, it takes 45 minutes for the wrinkles to fall out of the side of my face <laughs> from what they used to look like. I mean, it's just like aging is not exciting, but Fortunately for you, by the time that you, you start failing in some of the aging things, your, your sight gets worse, so it's, it's okay, right? <laughs> and, and then people are talking about your aging, but it's okay. You can't hear so well either. You know, so there's some real benefits, right? And, and you know, you're losing the hair on top, but it's growing out of your ears, so okay, you still have, it, you still have hair. Yeah, you know, you got to take what you can get. But there's also spiritual development, number four, cultivating a love for God. And we need to do this in our children and our grandchildren and in our own personal life. It says he grew in favor with God. Jesus grew in spiritual favor with his own heavenly father. It tells us in Luke 10, 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. The priority of your heart when it's the Lord. The Bible says if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else will be added to you. I mean, everything else just kind of falls into place, you guys, in priority when I love God first. And so we're developing that in our life spiritually. So are you developing your life spiritually? And then there's social development. It tells us also in verse 52, and 
Jesus grew in favor with God and with men. He grew socially. So he knew how to get along with people. And aren't all of these things what we want for our kids? Just think about it for your kids. Don't you want to grow, them to grow and understand the boundaries of submission? You want them to grow intellectually and love learning. You want them to grow in taking good care of their physical bodies. You want them to grow spiritually in a love for God. And you want them to be socially a blessing to, as the scriptures tell us, to love your neighbor as yourself in Luke 10, 27. This is, this is how you want your kids to go through life. You want to drop them off at their friend's house for a birthday party at the age of 10. And when you pick them up, those parents go, wow, you have an amazing son. You have an amazing daughter. Right? Don't you want to hear that about your kids? I tell people because they, they get so fixated, they got a three-year-old. Imagine what your child's going to look like when they're 30 years of age and invest in that goal. That's what the goal is. You're investing in developing these things in their life so at the age of 30, they are such a blessing to you. They are such a blessing to the people in their lives because of who they have become. How do we do that as parents? Sometimes we, we, we get too structured. It's as simple as just the parent's classroom is life. It says in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. He talks about a lifestyle of just a parent's classroom is just life. And I discovered, you know, your kids come home from school, you say, how was school? They say, fine. How's your friends? Fine. How was your test? Fine. Fine becomes the F word of the family. <laughs> it's a four-letter word, and you're so sick of hearing fine, right? You have no communication. You're trying to dialogue. You're at dinner. How's this? How's that? Fine. Fine. They get to the, their voice drops. Teenage. Fine. Fine. <laughs> you eat all this food and say fine. It's like I have this, or, you know, this caveman living with me here in my home. And the desire is to communicate. So what my wife and I discovered is that if you go for a walk, everything just tumbles out of their heart. If you lay down at bed with them at night, they get all chatty and you're exhausted. You've been up since five trying to kill it, you know, in your career or your business. And you lay down in bed. And now the kids want to talk. Because the longer they talk, they don't have to go to sleep, right? It's like, it's like okay, man, you're prying your eyeballs open. When you lie down, when you sit up, when you have devotions and... Um, you go for walks and just doing life. And people today, you know, we went through that phase where it's quality time. Let me tell you, as a parent, the only quality time is quantity time. And it's so hard to get it in a busy life, isn't it? It's very hard. And <laughs> you say, it's corona time now. We, we have all the time that we've ever wanted for the last year of our life. But you're sharing life because you have to build relationship. In all of this, you guys, what you don't even know, you know, it took me years, even being a Christian, to discover what a worldview was. Do you know you're developing as you do this and you train your kids in the ways of the Lord? You're building a worldview. A worldview is a comprehensive con conception or apprehension of the world, especially from a specific standpoint. So you develop a Christian worldview. It's from a biblical basis. And everybody in this room has a worldview, even if you have never articulated it. There's certain parameters or thoughts that you have that you look at the view. It's a lenses like glasses that you look at the life around you. You look at the world. Now, we think about those who grow up not knowing the Lord. They grew up and believing in evolution. What is their, their worldview? Now, there are three things that you really want to talk about to a person about their worldview. You want to talk about origin, purpose, and destination. For the evolutionists, if you talk about origin, they evolved by accident. There was this big bang. There was this premortal uh, soup, and, uh, you know, the polywog ends up getting the legs and goes up and becomes a monkey, and, and now here you are. Truly, you're, you are, uh, um, your uncle is a monkey. So you go from the goo to the zoo to you. That's the simple way to put it, right? And so that's your worldview. I'm, I'm an accident. And, and I mean, it's not really encouraging to be an accident, is it? I'm the accident in my family. My dad and mom had three children back to back, boom, boom, boom. My dad's like, enough of this, you know, be fruitful and multiply business. And so he got a vasectomy. Two months later, my mom got pregnant with me. Bam! My dad was so torqued off. He was, he was so angry. And once he finally calmed down, my mom said, well, he said, you're either going to be the president of the United States or a preacher. And so here I am fulfilling my dad's prophecy from the moment of conception. 
And they didn't even, they, came, they brought me home. You know, if you've seen one, you've seen them all, the youngest of four, they didn't have a name for me. So they came home and asked my Uncle Jack. They said, Jack, what should we name your nephew? And uh, my Uncle Jack's favorite cartoon at the time was uh, Ricochet Rabbit, bing, bing, bing. And so they named me Ricky Shea after a Looney Tune cartoon. And so <laughs> going through life as an accident, as a Looney Tune uh, cartoon character, I tell people, they say, what's your full name? They usually expect Richard, or I say, I say Ricky Shea. They go, no, that's really cute. No, no, really, what's your name? I said, Ricky Shea, that's my name. And when you, you know, show up, and, and you're, <laughs> and then my, my siblings, my three older siblings, knowing this whole story, because they were old enough to, you know, have the concept of it, they called me the milkman's kid. So you know what that does? And I'm little, like I'm four, and they're like, you're just a milkman's kid anyway. You're not even dad's kid. I'm like, what's that mean? I would run to my mom like, am I the milkman's kid? <laughs> Doesn't do a lot about your self-worth when you go through as an accident, named as a Looney Tune, and you think you're the milkman's kid. Okay? So, your origin, for those who evolved, your origin is you're an accident. Your purpose is just survival of the fittest. So it's not about loving God or loving your neighbor. It's just survival of the fittest. And then when you die, you're just going to be put in a hole in the ground and turn, return to dust. That doesn't really motivate you. That world, that world view, I'm an accident. My only purpose is to survive. And one day they're going to throw me in a hole and it's all over. Wow, I just feel inspired all of a sudden. <laughs> Yay, let's live this life. Let's go through it accidentally, surviving and stepping on others along the way, and one day we're going hell-bent right into a hole in the ground. Yay! But when you have origin, purpose, and destination with a Christian worldview, when I think of origin, I'm created by God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That warms my heart immediately. I'm not an accident. I do have a Looney Tune name, but I'm still not an accident. And I'm not the milkman's kid. My mom has convinced me. And as I got older, I looked exactly like my dad, so there was no denying it as I got older. But the purpose, what's the purpose of my life? To love God and love people. So beautiful. I get to love a perfect God that loves me and is gracious and forgave me, sent his son for me. God loves me. He loves you. So do you see the worldview, how it changes my daily perspective? I'm created by God. I get to love him. He's made a way for me to love him. And I get to love people with God's love. And then the destination to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I'm going to heaven, a perfect place where there's no more tears. There's no more sorrow. There's no more death. There's no more sin. There's no more temptation. That's why the older I get, the more I look forward to heaven. Like, I can't, can't wait to go home. Man, when I get my ticket, bam, I'm out of here. I'm ready to go be with the Lord. You see, the motivation of my life propels me with the incredible positive message of God's love. It's unbelievable. You see, which one do you want to invest in your kids? Which one do you want to either discourage them? Hey, you're an accident. <laughs> you got no purpose. You go into a hole in the ground. Feel inspired. <laughs> That's why Paul the Apostle, in talking about people like that, he says, their mindset is just, let's eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die, right? Let's, <laughs> let's live like a hog and die like a dog because all we got is the gusto, right? Our whole life is like a beer commercial. <laughs> I got to get the gusto now because I'll be too old to get it later. The thing is, is that right thinking leads to right living and wrong thinking leads to wrong living. And so whatever you're investing in, you're, you're investing in a mindset, you're investing in a philosophy, you're investing in theology, you're investing in ideology, and all of those things. Now, that's the goal. That's where we want to go. We want to develop we, relationally, we want to develop intellectually, we want to develop physically, we want to develop spiritually, we want to develop um, uh, socially, and all of that. But what are the tools that to get us there? In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, you know the, the volume, sheer volume of books for parents is overwhelming. And I feel bad for this generation trying to raise their kids with the internet. Kids, this, you're like terrified you're going to mess up your kids. And I, I want to encourage you, you're going to. But God's grace is big enough to handle it, Right? And so that's the encouragement that you're not a perfect parent, neither will they be perfect parents. 
And yet I'm amazed at what a beautiful parent my daughter and son-in-law are. I mean, they're just killing it. They're amazing with their, our two grandkids. But I want to give you four tools for the children and four tools for the parents from Ephesians. Simply four verses. It's not even a book. It's only four verses to figure out the principles to do this and to do it well. You see, the four things that we see for the responsibility of children is to cultivate obedience. From Ephesians 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So he says, the actions are, kids, you who are in this room, wake up, stop doodling, whatever you do, this moment's for you. You're simply to obey your parents in the Lord because it's right. When you see kids misbehaving and treating their parents with disrespect in the store, don't you just sit there? Even if you know nothing, you go, that's not right. That's not a good thing. <laughs> a manager found my mom, who was a single mom at the time with four of us kids. We were terrorizing the score, store. The manager found my mom and kicked all of us out of the store. So we know what that's like. I, like I said, I was raised like a little uh, <laughs> ragamuffin, a street urchin. And when you look at this, simple instruction, just obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. That has to do with your actions. The second is about your attitude. Verse two, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. To honor means to value or to respect. So parents, this is your conundrum, right? You ask your child, hey, go clean up your room. And they go and they clean up their room, but they do it with a stinky attitude all the way there. I'm sure you guys have never had that experience. But if you have, just welcome to my world for a little bit. So they go to do their room. So you think to yourself, well, they are obeying in action. Yeah, but their attitude sinks. So the action and the attitude needs to go together to raise good kids, right, in an awful world. Because what are you discovering? You're discovering that in training your children to obey what you ask and to do it with a respectful attitude is preparing them to go to the classroom and to obey their teacher, and to have a good attitude towards the teacher. So that when you get the report card and they talk about how they behave, they're impressed, right? And then they're going to get their first job at McDonald's when they're 16. And they're going to learn how to do what their manager says. And they're going to do it with a positive, respectful attitude. And they're going to get a promotion. Because there are other people working there that their parents did not teach them that. And they're not going to get a promotion. They're going to get their career or they're going to go to college, whatever it is. They're going to go into the military. And what do you have to learn in the microcosm of family? It is the preparation. It is the greenhouse for the rest of life on a macro scale. So you teach to obey an action, but you do it respectfully with the right attitude. So oftentimes, our kids would get reprimanded or corrected or whatever the discipline was based upon not obeying an action or having a stinky attitude. You know, they have to go hand in hand. If you're going to raise beautiful, good kids in a very dark, crazy world. But this is the awesome thing, is that this is the first, verse 2 tells us that this is the first commandment with a promise. Now think about it, kids, two simple things. Obey your parents and do it in a respectful manner because God's going to give you a promise. What's the promise? You mean if I obey my folks and I do it with a good attitude, I got a promise from God? Yeah, it's twofold. Check it out. These are the two promises that God gives to children when they do this. This is what they're going to discover. Verse 3, that it may be well with you. That means that you may succeed in all of life. That's what it means, that it may go well with you. So if a child learns to obey action and has a good attitude and respect, are they going far and everywhere, at school, on the ball team, in the military, in whatever their career is? Because what are people looking for? They're looking at people that can take instruction, do what they're asked, and to do it with a good attitude and do it consistently. That's all they're looking for. It's not rocket science, right? Just show up, do what you're asked to do, do it with a good attitude, do it consistently, and what? You are promotable, 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 and success just begins to be a part of life. Everything you do, there's, you succeed. That's what it means that it may go well with you. Who in their right mind as a parent would want life not to go well with their kids? Nobody. It's just ridiculous. Nobody, uh, you know, I want my kid to be an absolute failure in life. Nobody has that mindset. You want your kids to do well. You want your grandkids to do well. You want everybody to do well. You know what? You want to do well. And for some of us here today, we're 50 years old and we've never learned this lesson and we have not been promotable. We resist doing what we're supposed to do and we do it with a stinky attitude, and we wonder why everybody else gets promoted and not, and not us. But now at 50, 
You won't really listen to anybody, and so you're stuck. And it's not going well for you. And everybody around you knows it's not going well for you because you simply haven't learned and grown and developed and figured out how to be submissive to this awkward manager, this awkward boss. You learn going through life. You don't want to burn any bridges. You want to figure it out, right? Relationally, have emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence. Yeah, it's, the sermon's not over yet. Turn the alarm off. Okay. <laughs> that was the 15-minute bell. I got 15 minutes. Okay. So it's not only that you're going to succeed or do well in whatever you do, but it's also, and, and I just want, you know, this is the beautiful thing about a parent. We started with no information. The only information we had was a heart for God, my wife and I, and God's word to raise kids. And we raised kids, and we just applied what God said, and it works. So my son's 32, my daughter's 29, and they're amazing. They really are. My son was the youngest pilot to ever interview for Horizon Air. He had went and started you know, pilot lessons when he was 16, became a pilot at 17, and his goal was to work for Horizon Air. And he got there and he interviewed. They ran 50 pilots through in the day. He passed all of their tests. The chief hiring pilot asked him to come back. And he said, young man, obviously you can do this job. You've passed all of our tests. You really shine bright. But we have never hired anybody younger than 20 in the history of Horizon Air, so go grow up. He felt so devastated. He's like, man, I worked so hard for this, you know, opportunity. Because you see, in that sense, his, his skill had actually outstripped his age. So he, he was in a place that he couldn't be promoted. My daughter, when she was 15, she went to work at this bakery. But because she had relational skills and she learned love, truth, and discipline at home, she began to minister and to basically managed with an unofficial title at the store with people that were 18 and 19 years old. And twice, the manager came and said, hey, Jessica, would you, would you mind becoming our assistant manager? And Jessica, because she looked like she was 20 when she was 15, and she would remind them, I'm only 15? I don't think I could be managing the 19-year-old? I don't think I can do that. Oh, oh yeah, that's all right. We keep for, for, forgetting. <laughs> A band was going to go on the road, and they wanted my son to play bass with them, and he hung out with them, and he's very just mature and just such a you know, stellar young man. And they said, we want to take Caleb on the road with us. And, and I said, okay, that's cool, but, you know, uh, are you going to take care of him? Are you going to watch out for him? And they were thinking, what do you mean? And I said, well, he's only 14. I mean, he's going to turn 15, and, I mean, he's really mature, but you're adults, right? And you're taking him to, you know, big cities and say, you've got to watch out for my boy. And they are like, oh, we totally just spaced his age. <laughs> Because, you see, we live in a culture of this delayed adulthood that is actually not very fruitful. Do you know Jews in their culture that when you had your 13th birthday, you were bar mitzvahed, which meant you become a son of the law. You became an adult, a responsible adult at the age of 12. Think of that. A responsible adult. We're thinking, they're 30, they don't have it figured out, they're still playing video games in our basement. It's all right. They got their whole youth. Is that for real? Yeah. Oh, we won't touch on that any longer. We'll move on. <laughs> fourthly, fourthly, in verse 3, it says that you may live long on the earth. You see, if you apply all these things that you do, generally speaking, now it doesn't mean that children don't die or, you know, really fruitful young people don't die. But in general, it means you're going to have a very long life, right? Because you're learning self-control. You're not destroying your body. You're not... My brother, brother died at 53. He was addicted to prescription medication his whole life. Uh, from the age of 11, 12 years old. He embarked into the homosexual life. He became a heroin addict, intravenous heroin addict. He got AIDS. My brother died at complications with his immune system at the age of 53. Going from this raw bone guy, you know, 5'11", 165 pounds, to a guy that was about, you know, 5'8", 128 pounds with no teeth and looked like he's 80 years old. And he was 53. You see, your lifestyle... Unfortunately for me, my brother, he gave us, he recommitted his life to Jesus at the very end, and it was such a beautiful thing. But I love my brother. Even though I'm an atheist, I love my brother. I don't care what space you're coming from. God loves you. God wants to work in your life. And my father-in-law, his brother died at the age of 50. He just drank himself to death. Died of a massive heart attack because of what he was doing to his body. My mother-in-law, her twin sister died at 50, living a hard lifestyle. You see, living a hard lifestyle is going to do what? It's going to cut your life short. Now, don't get me wrong. I know people that are still killing it as far as a hard lifestyle, and they're in their 80s, and I go, dude, 
Like, you've got a cast iron liver. How are you doing this? You know, you're smoking five cigars a day. And, I mean, there are those anomalies that are just, it's crazy. I just look at it as God's given them more grace because they need it to the end until they come to Jesus. <laughs> so those four things, two perspectives, obedience, action, and attitude, respect, and then building your life on two promises. You're going to succeed if you do these things. And you're going to live a long, good life. That's what all of us want for our children. That's what we want for ourselves. Now, there's four requirements for parents, too. And very quickly, I have to give them to you. In verse 4, in one verse, it tells parents the general, general, four general principles that every parent needs at every age. Okay? It tells us in verse 4, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath. The first thing is the negative. Don't be a constant discouragement so that you're frustrating your kids to no end and they're angry. Parents can do this in multiple ways. Realize this, first of all, moms and dads, rules without relationship will always lead to rebellion. If you don't build a relationship, if you just say, I lay down the rules, I'm the, I'm, I'm the rule master, that will get you very, very little traction with the heart of a child. As they get older and it becomes more exacerbated by age and tension, if they're filled with wrath, what are the expectations you're putting on them? You see, the opposite is, You want to raise your kids in the greenhouse of encouragement, finding things that encourage. Some people say, you know, my kid's such a mess. He'll be 17. He's worthless. He's lazy. And they'd go through this whole tirade. Sometimes they'll do it with them standing right next to me. And my heart just sinks as a dad. And I just think, do you have any idea what you are doing to your child right now? You're dressing him down in front of a stranger. You think that kid is going to want to do anything that you have to say? when you're breaking his heart that way. So don't be a source of discouragement. You have to find those areas and encourage effort expended, not achievements made. This is an important distinction. Hey, just encourage them in effort because if you do, they'll always want to be trying and attempting things in a, in a courageous way. But if you say, here's the, the standard and then they fear never meeting that standard. So you want to encourage effort. My son, when he was 11, I had been training him for about a month about taking over the lawn responsibilities. He's 11, he mows the lawn, trimmed it, showed him how to do it, and then I left for the day. I goes, today, this Saturday, it's all you, boy. And so Caleb, he does it, and he mows the lawn, and I come home, and I look out the back patio, and when I look out, there's this mohawk in the grass. He, he, missed, he missed like this two-inch mohawk, right? Right straight out the back door, and, and I'm standing there. But I had determined when I was coming home, no matter what kind of job he did, I was going to encourage him about his job, because he's 11, right? It's not like he's an adult. He's 11. This is his first time. I'm going to come home and encourage him, because I can be very nitpicky. And so I, I'm going to encourage him. He, he walked up next to me. He's 11, and he looks out the window with me. And I said, son, you did a great job. And he goes, thanks, dad. I thought you were going to say something about that mohawk. I don't know how I missed that. You know, and, and he brought it up. And I said, well, I wasn't going to say anything about it. You know, you did a great job, 99.9%, that little bit. You'll get it next week. So fast forward, he's now running the, the crew for our property because we had 27 acres and a lot of grounds to take care of. He's got a couple of employees. One of them is his little sister. And I pull into the church. and We had these big, long grass berms. And I look down the thing. They had just mowed the lawn. There's this big mohawk. And I'm thinking, well, that's not my son. He's 17 now. He doesn't do Mohawks anywhere, anymore. He's, he's, he's a very advanced in his uh, lawn care. And I come and say, and I said, hey, what about the Mohawk out there? And he smiled. He goes, yeah, isn't that something? I decided to leave it. And I said, why'd you do that? He goes, well, I remember when you were gracious to me and I left the Mohawk. Well, Jessica did that, my, his little sister. And so he had just trained her on the driving lawn. You see, grace runs downhill, you guys. And encouragement runs downhill. He said, I just encouraged her, her and Joe that did it. You know, do your kids like to be with you because you're a source of encouragement? They want to be around you because they know that there's nobody that has their back like you as a source of encouragement. Are you the one they're doing this and they're doing this? I, I want you to know that you can pick anything and anybody at any time apart. It's not that you don't see it. You know how God looks at you every day? Do you know how God looks at you? The scriptures declare that through faith in Jesus, he looks at you as you are 100% perfect through Jesus' love and blood. Do you know that? How do you look at people? Well, this is wrong, and then, you know, you go through, or do you want to look with the eyes of Jesus and others? It's really transformative. Your kids will sense it. Everybody around you will sense it. Because you become a person that people actually are attracted to. The common people heard Jesus gladly. They wanted to get close to Jesus. What did they sense? A flood of love and grace coming towards them. 
You know why a lot of people don't want to hang out with us? Because they're not feeling a lot of flood of love or grace. They're feeling a lot of animosity. They're feeling a lot of judgment. They're feeling a lot of garbage. So why, why do I want to hang out with that? You see, parents, these four things for us can be revolutionary. These other three things, just for the sake of our time, I have to just hit them. I wish I could download and unpack a lot more information for you, but our time restricts us. In verse 4, it says, but bring them up. This is cultivating love. It means to nourish and to cherish them. Nothing produces security in the heart of a child like unconditional love. No matter what, my mom and dad love me. No matter how bad I feel, my mom and dad love me. No matter how bad I mess up, there's never a point, a breaking point. And your kids need to have that reiterated. You know, I know I've had people in their 50s, grown men, tough guys, cry like little babies in my office in counseling, saying all I ever wanted to know and to hear was my dad say, I love you, and throw his arms around me. That's all I wanted to hear my whole life. You see, that kind of love is what every human heart, male, female, is looking for. And so if you can be a conduit of that, you will attract people like crazy. You draw more people with honey than you do with vinegar. Also, we want to cultivate discipline, it says, in training. And this is simply teaching your kids that there's consequences for our actions. And you, you train them all the way through life that there's consequences for their actions so that they relate that and they build a life of self-control. And lastly, you want to cultivate communication. It says, an admonition of the Lord, being able to talk to people. And people know that they can talk to you about anything and you're not just going to shut them down. It doesn't mean you're going to agree with their opinion, but you'll hear them out and you'll listen. You know, some of us just need, you know, one of the greatest dynamics that can transform your relationships, a lot of us just need to learn how to listen. There's a reason you have two ears and one mouth. And that is to listen and then to communicate love and truth through that process. But can I just wrap something up? I I shared, saved five minutes here at the end just to touch on it because it's overwhelming our culture. Postmodernism, in an activist way, is sweeping across America like a tsunami. That's what's happening in the whole amplified race thing through critical race theory that's coming from postmodern doctrine that is in the school systems and in the colleges. And then queer theory, which is another theory about gender identity. And then post-colonialization, which is basically destroying and hating America because it was built upon racism. These three disciplines, if you don't know this, you just need to get educated about what's going on in America. But I think about kids learning today that they don't even know what gender they are. There's nothing more troubling to me. Because you see, Genesis 1 and 2 is very simple. Genesis 1 and 2, the Lord mentions this at the creation. And then Jesus, if you want to know what Jesus thinks about it, so (laughs) here we have it at creation. And Jesus says in Matthew, well, first of all, let me just mention gender dysphoria, what is going on in America. Dysphoria is a profound state of unease or dissatisfaction in a psychiatric context. Dysphoria may accompany depression, anxiety, or agitation. To the, the term is often used to refer to gender dysphoria experienced by people whose gender identity does not align with their assigned sex. So they're confused, basically, in their mental thoughts about their gender. Jesus says this in Matthew 19, 4 and 5. Have you not read? No, they have not read <laughs> the Bible. And he who, he who made them at the beginning, God who created them, made them how? Male and female. In Genesis chapter 1, the first, bio, first chapter in the Bible, God says, I created them male and female. God is very clear about the X and Y chromosomes in life. And said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus quotes this passage of scripture. The question was about divorce, but for the sake of our time, I can't imagine raising kids in a crazy world that they would go to school and they would tell them, hey, why don't you decide if you're a little boy or a little girl? Talk about confusion. If you just even open that up to them. I I don't know about you. I just grew up knowing I was a boy my whole life. I had the body parts. And I looked at girls and thought, wow, shoot, dang, they're cute, right? And, and we now have this 
you know, now there's over a hundred different definitions of your gender or sex identity, where the Bible just says there's two. Now, if you're a kid trying to figure these things out, that's a little complex. So queer theory, which is in the postmodern doctrine, any stable categories, they would call this a stable category of essentialism, they dismiss all of it because it's stable. If you say you're a boy or you say you're a girl, you can't just say that. And you, and you also can't say that it's just heterosexual in nature. Well, the only way you reproduce is if a boy and a girl get together. It's the only way to re- reproduce, correct? Now, don't get me wrong. Everything outside of God's sexual context. You know, this is from Genesis to Revelation. Do you know that the only place God gives us without missing the mark of sin, sexual expression, is in marriage? A husband and a wife. Like you, I grew up as a very immoral person. No, I shouldn't say that. Like you. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Please forgive me. That, that was a Freudian slip, so it only applies maybe to a couple. So... <laughs> I grew up as a very immoral, sexually violent, in trouble with the law, all kinds of stuff, drugs, all, all that stuff. And so I get saved, I come to Jesus, and I share with uh, uh, my high school sweetheart, who is my wife now, uh, in two months, if we make it, it'll be 35 years of, of marriage. But the thing is, is you, you know, that's all right, we're not there yet, clap after the 35. So <laughs> we, my wife and I always tell each other, we ain't out of the woods yet, baby. <laughs> so... Um, but the thing is, we're sitting in church, and, and we're heterosexual, but we're having sex outside of marriage. Now, we're engaged, and we're in sexual sin, and the preacher, I don't know anything about the Bible, right? So I'm just coming to church, doop the doop I'm a young Christian, I love Jesus, he's forgiven me of my sins, and I'm sitting there, and the preacher says, hey, this is the only context, and I look at the passage of Scripture, and I'm like, that is what the Bible says. I look at Tammy, I said, we're living in sin. This isn't good, let's, let's get out of this. Let's... So when I'm talking to my people that I meet that are in the gay lifestyle or the lesbian lifestyle or whatever, I have no issue with, it. we're all in sexual sin. I tell them, hey man, I was in total sexual sin just like you. It was just, a, you know, I had a different attraction than you did. But I had to repent and come into God's will, which was the only sexual expression that God blesses is in the context of a man and a woman in marriage. Now that's just too narrow for postmodern people, right? It's too stable. It's too consistent. They have to disrupt and deconstruct all of American civilization. That's their goal. Now, they don't know how to build anything productive, but they know how to destroy everything by telling us we're xenophobes and we're homophobes and we're patriarchal, and they go through this whole list, and by the end, you're in a corner cowering like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm white, I'm sorry. You know, it's like... (laughs) Enough with that. You see, God in his word, this is his manual. This is God's. There's only one human race. I mean, one race, and it's human, Right? doesn't matter what color you are. God loves you, right? There's no racism. I mean, there is racism. I've seen it up close. What I'm saying is that everything is not some racial thing. It's crazy what's going on. But our kids are growing up in this environment, and you're going to have to teach your kids, your five-year-old, you start your conversations by apologizing for being white. That's nuts. I would never do that to a black family. Don't ever, you know, never be ashamed of whatever nationality you are. It's your heritage. Right? If you're Asian or you're, you're African American or you're Latino, whatever, praise God for your heritage. Isn't that a view? You know, amen. <laughs> but I also know that the, the narrowness, and that's what Jesus said, that the way is very narrow coming into the gospel, and you've got to repent from your sin. And you know, there's more people in sexual sin in a heterosexual way in any congregation. Right now, there's people here that you're living in heterosexual sin. Well, you know, I mean, whether you're homosexual, lesbian, uh, transgender, whatever, or you're heterosexual in your sin, you got to come out of it. You got to step into that place of, hey, this is the place that sexuality is to be expressed within the covenant of marriage, and everything outside of that, it's sin. You go, well, I never. Well, you have now. So I was living in sexual sin with my girlfriend, the love of my life. I had proposed to her, and we kind of rationalized, and I didn't really know the Bible taught that. And so I told her, we got to get out of this. And Tammy, it's like, I could not be in the same room with her without touching this girl. She's gorgeous. She's beautiful. So I moved 500 miles away to Las Vegas. Now, who goes to Sin City to get away from sexual sin? (laughs) Right? Who does that? Doesn't work. 
Right? No, it does work. I went there and got involved with a great church where sin abounds, grace does that much more, and we're in this rocking church, and I got out of sexual sin, and then later, my, you know, Tammy moves down, we're married, my brother comes, and the church took over the whole wet and wild park on the strip in Vegas to baptize everybody. So they got baptized in the wave pool in Las Vegas. <laughs> and so I share that to say, hey, hey, I don't care where you're coming, I've come from the same place. Isn't this the beautiful thing about the good news of Jesus? Is he loves you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to help you. And he wants to lead your life so that it's a fruitful blessing. His commands are not, his instruction are not, his precepts are not to restrict your freedom. They're to bless you with the healthiest form of life you could possibly have. That's his goal. And I don't care where you're coming from. God loves you here today. He cares about you, and he wants to work in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and pray that you would build us up right now. And I just pray, Lord, specifically as we're talking about kids, we're talking about these dynamics that are so challenging. Some of us are really heartbroken right now about our children. And Lord, I just want to pray specifically for families here today. And Lord, I just pray that you would touch the parents, the grandparents, those who are, have children with them in their home and those who have grown children. If you're just struggling right now with some family relationships and you're really burdened about your kids or your grandkids or your great-grandkids, I want you to stand up right where you're at and we're going to pray for you and I'm going to pray along with you. Just stand up right, God bless you guys back there. You want to pray for your kids? You just stand up by faith and we're going to intercede. The Lord knows these kids that are represented and those who are standing Lord, you see the men and women all across this room, that they're burdened for their children and their grandchildren. And Lord, I just pray that you know every face, you know every name, you know the hair upon every head of these children that were, are represented by those who are standing. And we are praying, and you promised us, Lord, that you would show mercy to a thousand generations of those Lord, that love you. And we love you here today. And Lord, we pray for a thousand generations until you come again, Lord, that you would help us with our kids in these crazy times. And we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Thank you, Lord, in advance for how you're going to work, even this week, in the lives of our family. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together and sing this closing song. God bless you guys.